In St. Louis, the serial killer strikes and vanishes. Leaving little evidence in his wake. Blending into the community, he confounds authorities for more than three decades. To catch him, police must find his weakness and reveal the true face. Thursday, November 3rd, 1977, two men drove up to an Illinois farmhouse. Sir, how are you this evening? Oh, fine. Okay. You're Mr. Graham, right? Yes, sir. Oh, I'm Bob Beck, and I'm from... While one man waited in the car, the other introduced Mr. himself Graham. as a representative of the Farmers Union. Sure, come on in. Great. My pleasure. Alan Graham led him into his home. County Sheriff's Department received a call that a man and his wife had been shot. Paramedics were dispatched to the location. Velma Graham died at the scene. Her husband, Alan, died later that night. Investigators secured the house and called for crime scene technicians to process the evidence. Detectives from the Madison County Sheriff's Department arrived as the ambulance was leaving. Bob Hertz worked the scene. At first glance, going into the house, it was obvious that uh, uh, the house had been ransacked, uh, the house was in disarray. Uh, one of the uh, uh, immediate assumptions made on my part was uh, that it appeared that this could be a situation where a burglary to the house went haywire. Detectives searched the plunder home but found no clues that could lead them to the killer. Madison County Prosecutor Donald okay. Weber joined that, the investigation. Right there. Who did that? There's just something about some crime scenes where you get a very cold feeling. There's no trails, there's no leads. This is going to be a long one. And that's the way I felt that night when I went in that house. This is going to be a long investigation, and we're going to have to get lucky to catch these people. Turning up no leads, investigators called in the Illinois State Police. Sergeant Dennis Kuba encountered a community paralyzed by fear. People were concerned in living in that area. What kind of person would come in and commit a home invasion, robbery, and put two people on the floor and put a gun behind their head and kill them? 
And so we constantly had phone calls. It was a frustrating feeling. Barbara. Oh, it'll be all right, Russell. The murders Get of the Grahams it. left their son Russell and his wife Barbara Boyle Graham devastated. The Grahams were well respected in the community. The police had no idea who could have wanted this couple dead. Detectives attended the funeral. They were on the lookout for anyone suspicious. They found nothing. Open wider. That's it. Here we go. Up. In their search for a robber desperate enough to kill his victims, police never considered he might be hiding behind the mask of a trusted Let professional. Like Glennon Engelman, doctor of dentistry. Do it again. Doctor, I'm sorry. Uh, that's okay, Karen. Please. Doctor Engelman worked out of a small office in nearby St. Louis's South Side. The test that I'm working on right now is the lower left hand quadrant. He was a mediocre dentist, but he was the best many of his working class patients could afford. skills as a dentist, but he more than made up for them as a killer. Hi. Uh, Karen? Yeah. Go to lunch now. Okay. Thank you. He had grown up in St. Louis and still kept a close circle of old friends. One of these friends was Barbara Boyle Graham. As a result of her in-law's murders, Barbara's husband would soon be a rich man. Everything seemed to be working just as Engelman had planned. It was now time for he and Barbara to begin working closely together. Very closely. What? While he was plotting with Barbara, his relationship with his third wife, Rita, was on the rocks. His modest practice never seemed to bring in enough money, and it seemed they were always short on cash. Hi, Rita. To make up the shortfall, Engelman turned to the business of murder. Police in Illinois continued to investigate the Graham murders. It seemed all they had were dead ends. Madison County Detective Bob Hertz was haunted by the senseless nature of the crime. You take a case like the Graham killings, you spend 18, 20 hour days for weeks, four or five weeks, the only case that you work, and after four or five weeks you, you sit back and you, you analyze where you're at and you're really no better off than you were four or five weeks ago. The level of violence in this case is the thing that really keeps you moving. You can't forget what happened. Police had no real leads. The only people who benefited from the killings were the Graham's two sons, but nothing linked them to the crime. Russell Graham inherited a quarter of a million dollars as his share of his late parents' estate. Wet, they're wet. Okay. Yeah. So, His wife, out. Barbara, had taken out several life insurance policies on her husband, totaling over $160,000. Oh, no. I'm going to go to the store and buy the car store. Okay. okay. Bye. I'll see you later. Almost immediately after the couple was married, Barbara began obtaining these policies through the mail without Russell's knowledge, forging her husband's signature on the applications. With all the insurance policies in place, it was time to put the dentist's plan into action. On the evening of March 31st, 1979, 17 months after the death of his parents, Russell Graham left for his job at an oil refinery. For Barbara and her old friend, Glennon Ingle, it was the night they had been plotting for nearly two years. 
Barbara had persuaded Russell to change his will, naming her as his sole owner. She would also get Russell's life insurance benefits. Barbara's share of her dead in-law's estate would be another $250,000. considerable amount of blood on the floor. Barbara immediately began to mop it up with towels. Russell Graham was a big man, six foot two to 260 pounds. Dragging him into the back seat was extremely difficult. Barbara to wait a few hours, then call the refinery to inquire if Russell had to work late. She then started calling the hospitals, and finally in the morning called the police. With Russell's body in the back of the Camaro, Engelman drove his friend Bill Carpenter back to the shopping center where they had left his car. Carpenter then followed Engelman to the parking lot of a seedy motel known for prostitution in East St. Louis. The dentist put prophylactics in Russell's pocket so it would look like he was seeing a prostitute. And kept his wallet and watch so it would appear as if he'd been robbed. they learned that a missing persons report had been issued on Graham. The description was sent to the police. Graham's head had been wrapped with towels. Forensic technicians processed the car, but no fingerprints were found besides those of Graham and his family. 
coroner determined he died from a gunshot wound. In a pocket of his jeans, investigators found the condoms Engelman planted there. The part of town where Russell Graham's body had been discovered was notorious for prostitution and street crime. Sergeant Dennis Kuba theorized that he had been killed while cruising for sex. We had thought the way things looked and the way he was killed and outside of a hotel and that there was prophylactics in his pocket that perhaps the shooting was related to him visiting a prostitute. I think that's an interesting thing. This one piece will make 52 layers. Watch on mobile devices or the big screen. All for free. No subscription required. Investigators hit the streets. They were looking for any leads that might point them to the killer. For Madison County Prosecutor Donald Weber, something about Russell Graham's murder didn't sit right. He was left down in a neighborhood frequented by prostitutes, at a motel frequented by prostitutes. There were suspicious circumstances, but none of those checked out with respect to Russell's character. He simply wasn't that kind of person. He was a steady worker. He was a good son. He was a loving husband. The investigation into Russell's death stalled, as had the investigation into his parents' death two years earlier. Donald Weber felt there had to be a link. Everyone's first impression was that the three murders were related, had to be related. There simply aren't coincidences like that in law enforcement but there was no evidence to link the two crimes. Without evidence, the police had no hope of identifying a suspect. All they knew for certain was they had to capture this killer before he claimed another victim. An Illinois family and the victims of three murders. A farm couple in Madison County had been shot to death in an apparent invasion Two years later, one of their two sons was found murdered in the back of his car in East St. Louis, Illinois. Police wondered if the crimes were related, but they'd run out of leads. And then they got a break. A prison inmate confessed to the murder of Russell Graham. In a detailed statement, Alan Jackson told a detective that his girlfriend lured Graham into a motel room for sex planning to rob him, but he fought back and Jackson shot him. The Illinois police closed the Russell Graham murder case. While police were chasing dead ends in the murder of Russell's parents, the dentist was having troubles of his own. He right, was in debt to a St. Louis dental lab. He tended to be careless when taking impressions of his client's teeth. Put those away. Okay. How's it going, son? About another hour, probably, on this one. The lab was run by Susan Barnes, who had begun to charge the dentist for the additional time spent correcting his poor workmanship. Can you get these done in the next hour? Yeah. Susan Barnes had been hounding the doctor for payment. Engelman was furious about the charges and refused to pay them. Hello? You know that voice. Yes, Susan. Yes. I've come for my money. She was growing tired of waiting for her money and decided to sue the dentist to collect to solve his own financial problems. Dr. Glennon Engelman had killed Barbara Graham's in-laws and her husband. She then inherited the family fortune and collected a huge insurance settlement. Engelman was waiting for his cut from his close friend, Barbara. It's okay, Karen. I've been expecting him. Oh, Dr. Engelman? Yes, sir. The payoff he was expecting turned out to be a summons from Susan Barnes. Sorry about this, Nancy. Uh, must be some mistake. Engelman had no intention of going to court. He also had no intention of going to jail. And thanks to Alan Jackson's confession, Engelman felt certain no one would suspect him of killing Russell Graham. Now he decided to take care of Susan Barnes.
Susan Barnes left her St. Louis dental pad at 4.45 that afternoon. The judgment against Engelman was to be enforced in just one week. The court would force her to pay her the money she was owed. His office was close enough to the lab that he could see the smoke from the explosion from his window. Look at all that smoke. Susan Barnes was no longer around to take Engelman to court. What was it? Because the dentist couldn't pay his bills, That's he'd amazing. simply eliminate that is. his creditor. Police department, can I help you? The St. Louis, Missouri police got a call that a car had been bombed in the southern part of the city. Officers and firefighters right, were dispatched to the scene. Studio 5, Captain Longquist. Studio 5, Captain When they arrived, they observed that the driver had been killed instantly by the blast. Calling in the vehicle tag number, investigators learned it was registered to a Susan Barnes. An attaché case with papers also belonged to Barnes. The entire St. Louis Bomb and Arson Unit responded, along with federal agents specializing in bomb investigations. Investigators observed that pieces of the car and the woman's body were scattered over a two-block area. In the city of St. Louis, 21 persons had been killed over the previous two years in car bombings. Federal agent William McGarvey, who was called in to work the case, suspected it was connected to the mob. St. Louis had been experiencing a, a rash of automobile car bombings. We've had quite a few, and we've investigated a number of automobile bombings in the St. Louis area. Now, those bombings were related to a a feud between two factions of an organized crime group who were fighting over control of the local labor unions in St. Louis. But this didn't fit the pattern of the other bombings. For one thing, the victim was a woman. Investigators canvassed area residents, but no one could recall noticing anything unusual that afternoon. Police and federal agents processed the scene late into the night. The murder of Susan Barnes was a puzzle that agents worked tirelessly to solve. It was on their minds constantly, even when they weren't officially caught. Each week, investigators got together to discuss their cases. As McGarvey explained the Barnes case, another agent thought it sounded similar to a bombing incident that had taken place 10 months earlier. The agent went on to explain to McGarvey that on the afternoon of March 20th, 1979, the St. Louis Bomb Squad and federal agents responded to a reported bombing at a duplex on the city's south side. Technicians recovered seven sticks of dynamite from the backyard. A homemade pressure switch and parts of a six-volt battery were also found. For some reason, only a minor explosion had taken place, scattering the dynamite. The resident, Susan Barnes, told the agent she'd been awakened by a loud noise early that morning, but thought nothing of it until she returned from work and saw the damage. The agents discovered that the dynamite had crystallized, causing the explosion to go awry. To McGarvey, it was clear that someone had wanted Susan Barnes dead for some time. The agent learned that the day following the attempted bombing, police had visited the intended victim at her dental lab. Barnes had told them that her ex-husband started the business 27 years earlier. Their divorce had been amicable. 
She did mention that a certain dentist, Glennon Engelman, owed her money. Excuse me, doctor. Yes, Karen? There are two gentlemen here to see you. OK. Get right back. Please remove the cotton rolls from Pat's mouth. Police and federal agents questioned Engelman about the house bombing, but learned he had an alibi. Usually on Thursdays, I do my charity work for dental patients. His alibi checked out. With no physical evidence to tie the dentist Good to the crime, his name was taken off the list of suspects. McGarvey suspected the two incidents were related. To confirm there was a connection, McGarvey turned to Harold Messler at the crime lab. He asked him to compare the evidence from the recent bomb with a device found outside Susan Barnes' garage. Messler focused on what remained of the triggering devices from both bombs. The bombs matched. The federal agents now knew the killing of Susan Barnes had been planned for some time. McGarvey put the dentist back on the list of suspects. He suspected it may have been Glennon Engelman's way of settling his feud once and for all. What the agents needed now was proof. As investigators searched for Susan Barnes' killer, Special Agent McGarvey began looking into the victim's finances. He learned that Dr. Glennon Engelman owed her money, and Barnes had been suing him to collect it. Gotta fill this cavity. Excuse me, doctor. Ah. There are some gentlemen here to see you. Not now, Karen. Hey, Dr. Engelman. Kate Brown. The agent wanted to talk Could with you the calm dentist. Down. I really hate to bother you. Only take a few minutes of your time. I'm, I'm, I'm sorry. Catherine, we're going to reschedule. Is that okay? He agreed to come down to the station. Once he arrived, Engelman refused to answer their questions. He also refused to be swabbed for explosives residue or submit to any other type of examination. Unless you're going to arrest me, please do so. Process me and give me my phone call. Otherwise, I'd like to get back to my office, gentlemen. Special Agent McGarvey. During the course of the interviews with Dr. Engelman, he was uh, extremely arrogant. He was self-assured. And uh, he thought he was smarter than everybody else around him. Without any physical evidence to charge him with, they had to let him go. While en route back to his office, Engelman offered the police some advice. You got the wrong person in this car. He told them that Barnes had a disgruntled ex-employee, a delivery man whose hours she had cut. And this, according to Engelman, might give the delivery man a motive for murder. Sure. What you need to do is go through her records and find out who this guy is, bring him in, and interrogate him. Well, I think you should be writing this down. As with the first bombing attempt, Engelman claimed he had an alibi. He had been booked solid with patients all day. As proof, he gave the police a page out of his appointment book. January 14th. Does that make you happy? Yes, sir. Thanks. Anything else I can do for you? Again, Seriously. Engelman's alibi checked out. I would just love to do some more for you. Other than that, the agents have a night time to the bombing. Thank you. To try and confirm Engelman's story about an angry ex-employee, investigators interviewed the victim's ex-husband. John Barnes Sr. said he knew nothing about any angry employees. When asked what he knew about Glenn and Engelman, Barnes said he and Susan were once good friends of the dentist, but that changed after Susan took over the lab. He told the agents that over 20 years ago, Engelman was suspected of being involved in an unsolved murder. The victim, said Barnes, was a man named Ted Baker. Investigators dug up what they could find on the Baker killing. An officer was sent to retrieve the files. Twenty years after the fact, the case was still unsolved. As agents poured over the files, they learned that in the late 1950s, the murder of Ted Baker made headlines. 
That case was one of St. Louis's most famous on-south homicides. That case involved the shooting of uh, Mr. Baker and uh, the running over of him with an automobile. On the evening of December 17, 1958, a St. Louis police officer responded to a report of an apparent accident near a local museum. But this was no ordinary hit and run. The officer observed three penetrating wounds to the victim's face. There was also a large pool of blood several feet away. It appeared that the man had been lying in the street, bleeding for some time before being struck by a vehicle. His driver's license identified him as Ted Baker. All right, I suppose. Baker's widow, Edith, told police she had no idea what her husband might have been doing behind the art museum. He had been married for only six months, she said. Were you ever married before? When asked if she had ever been married before, Edith said yes, but Ted didn't know it. You mean you never told him? Retired St. Louis police detective Jim Hackett remembers he was shocked. She was a young girl, and then when she topped it off and said, yes, I, I have been married before, but uh, my present husband, who happened to be the deceased, was not aware of it. Boy, that really jumped out at me. I thought that was highly unusual. Edith Baker told Hackett she'd been married to a dentist, but they had divorced three years earlier. She said his name was Dr. Glenn Engelman, and he had also been her late husband's dentist. As McGarvey read the old police files, he learned that officers from the St. Louis Police Department went to question a woman who, at the age of 31, had married a second time. The couple was living with the dentist's mother. What can I do for you, John? Engelman claimed he had been in his office seeing patients at the time Baker was murdered. Then I took uh, about an hour to go get my wife a, a Christmas He'd just gone out to buy a Christmas present for his wife. Emergency patient that took me to about maybe... He made some statements as to uh, where he was uh, on the evening of the, uh, of the incident. And uh, in checking them out, uh, there were some loopholes. There were some times that were not uh, accountable. Although Engelman was a suspect, without any physical evidence, the 1958 murder investigation hit a dead end. Reviewing the nearly 22-year-old case, McGarvey learned the insurance company paid Baker's widow $64,000. Investigators then learned Edith Baker invested some of the money in Engelman's business. It seemed the more Agent McGarvey learned about the dentist, the more questions arose. McGarvey wondered if the dentist's third wife Rita held any answers. He learned the couple's rocky marriage had recently ended in divorce. We also discovered that, uh, that they had been divorced for about two years and that the divorce was a very messy divorce. They had some problems with child custody and uh, there was a lot of hard feelings about the divorce. So we. We decided that it might be a good idea to contact her to see if she had any information that she could provide us about uh, the background of Dr. Engelman. Investigators suspected Rita might know something about the bombing death of Susan Barnes. Five days after the bombing, agents paid her a visit. She had a 10-year-old son by Engelman, and that kept them close. She told the agents she still saw the dentist regularly, but was reticent to talk about it. She appeared to be very nervous. She appeared to be terrified. And uh, she told us that she uh, didn't want to talk to us because she felt that uh, she was going to be Dr. Engelman's next victim. The agents assured Rita their conversation would remain confidential. After some discussion, uh, and after uh, providing her with some guarantees that we would protect her and her son, no matter the outcome of the case, uh, she agreed to talk to us about what she knew about Dr. Engelman. She invited them in. 
so she then began telling us about the information that she had. Now, during the course of their marriage, Dr. Engelman had told her about several murders that he had committed. He either told her or he intimated to her that he had, that he had committed these murders. And some of the murders he went into detail, others he didn't. Agents asked Rita Engelman to come into their offices for an interview. Listen, what we're going to do is we're going to go ahead and, and it, 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 it's pretty... They wanted more details about her ex-husband's violent past. Let us know why you're here and, and which we'll talk about. Rita told the investigators that Engelman had threatened her life. He vowed to take their son away from her. Nothing would stop him, he said. Engelman intimated that when Brian reached the age of 14, he would kill me if necessary to get his son. There were several times when he told her that a, that a son, that a boy, doesn't need his, does not need his mother anymore after the age of 14 and that he was going to do anything in his power to get custody of his boy. Rita said she divorced Engelman two years earlier in 1978 because she was finally convinced he was dangerous and capable of murder. That fact first struck home on September 5th, 1976. Brian's always asking, where's dad? He's never here. He was labor day. He never spends time They were still married at the time, and Rita was angry with Engelman for not spending the day with her and Brian. He came home in the middle of the afternoon and immediately took off his muddy clothes and began washing them. Engelman told Rita he had been out to a quarry near Pacific, Missouri and had just killed a man. The victim, he said, was Paul Henderson. Mm -hmm. I just shot him. What? Made it look like a bunch of target shooters did. Terrible things. The dentist told Rita he shot Paul Henderson to help out his wife, Maria Montoya Henderson. Maria had worked for the dentist and he'd taken her under his wing. She needed money and Paul's life insurance policy paid handsomely. Engelman was supposed to get $10,000 as part of the deal. He needed it to pay his taxes, Rita said. You can't know any of us. It was a chilling story, but investigators wondered how much of it was true. If it was true, they would need some proof. Before going any further, they needed to check it out. It had only been four days since the bombing death of Susan Barnes, and agents began keeping a closer watch on the dentist. If Rita was telling the truth, they were looking at a serial killer whose crimes reached back nearly 30 years. Less than a week after Susan Barnes was killed by a bomb outside of St. Louis Dental Lab, investigators had narrowed their list of suspects. Special Agent McGarvey was unsure how much he could believe in Peter Engelman's story, especially her assertion that her ex-husband was involved in a murder in the late 1970s. Garvey began to scour the police records to try and corroborate her story. He called John McCready of the St. Louis County Police and asked him if he knew about a murder that occurred around Labor Day three years earlier in his jurisdiction. Hey, Bill, how are you? McCready confirmed that a murder did in fact occur at a quarry in Pacific, Missouri on that very day. The victim, Paul Henderson, had indeed been married to Maria Montoya. McCready told us that he was very familiar with that case, that he had worked on the case, that he supervised the detectives on that case, and it was still an open investigation. With no real leads, the case had gone cold. McGarvey compared what Rita Engelman had told him with the police file. McGarvey learned that on September 5th, 1976, nearly three and a half years before the bombing death of Susan Barnes, police received a report of a shooting at a quarry. When an ambulance crew arrived, they found 26-year-old Paul Henderson barely conscious with a single gunshot wound to his back. Henderson was pronounced dead on arrival at a local hospital. 
Highway patrol officers questioned the victim's wife, Maria Montoya Henderson. She said they were on a walk when a shot came out of nowhere. Lieutenant John McCready recalls Maria's story. She said she didn't really know what happened, that she was just standing there and all of a sudden she hears a noise and the next thing she knows her husband's on his knees and he's saying, get me help. Maria pointed out where her husband was standing when he was shot. And then there was a cross constructed out of duct tape taped to the wall, which gave the appearance that this cross was a target and that someone from the hill across the pond was shooting at this particular uh, target. Hey, I've got a gun over here. Detective. Let's call forensics out. OK. Hidden under a pile of leaves, investigators found a bolt-action rifle with a telescopic sight. Despite their suspicions, investigators had no evidence to prove that Paul Anderson's death was anything but accidental. Within a week of the killing, the ballistics test confirmed that the rifle found at the scene had fired the fatal bullet. It was examined for latent fingerprints, but none were found. By tracing the serial number of the rifle, they learned the gun was stolen. The investigation was getting nowhere. And that's when we decided we would do a, a background investigation on the victim's wife, uh, also on the victim himself. Maria Montoya Henderson was so distraught she checked into a hospital. Her brother, Jose, who was a close friend of Dr. Engelman's, kept watch and screened her calls. Maria told investigators that her husband, Paul, had driven her out to the quarry to show her some caves. McCready learned that although they had been married for less than a year, the couple was heavily insured. As a result of the, the insurance, it was approximately $80,000 that the victim's wife was a beneficiary of. And all this was obtained within uh, probably six months of the killing, so that certainly was, uh, was suspicious. Agent McGarvey asked if the name right. Glennon Ingle was ever turned needed. up in the initial investigation. This is what we needed. Lieutenant McCready told the agent he found a job application Maria had filled out listing Dr. Glennon Ingle as her former employer. Right At the time of the initial investigation, this meant nothing. But to Agent McGarvey, it seemed like the link he was looking for. He'd also seen the proof that Rita Engelman was telling the truth. The details Rita Engelman had given investigators checked out. They lent credence to her story, but they still needed hard evidence. Nothing she said brought them any closer to prosecuting her. Special Agent McGarvey knew he needed to speak more with Douglas' ex-wife. He arranged another meeting with Rita. The agents, fearing for Rita's safety, asked her to meet them at a hotel. Her credibility now established, investigators began to take her more seriously. Gentlemen, this is Rita Engelman. Rita, this is everybody that you're going to be working with. Rita started to open up, and more horrors came pouring out. She remembered another untimely death that occurred in 1962, just after she and Engelman started Rita, Rita Engelman. Rita told agents that Engelman had a niece named Sally who had spent some time living with her uncle. Engelman's sister eventually introduced Sally to Ed Franklin, a man she had met in a dance club. Sally and Ed were soon married. Special Agent Bill McGarvey. He chose to surround himself with people who were less educated than he was. He was unable to manipulate people into doing things that they wouldn't otherwise do. And in fact, that's really what made the man so dangerous. Even after her wedding, Sally remained very close to the dentist. Rita told investigators that Engelman began building a drag strip. It was his first and last business venture. Engelman was overseeing the project himself. It was a lot of work, and the dentist needed every hand he could get. 
He asked Sally's husband, Ed Franklin, to help him with some of the construction. The dentist asked some other men to pitch in, including Jose Montoya. They had discovered an abandoned well on the property. Engelman was afraid someone would fall into it and hurt themselves. He decided to try and collapse it in on itself. The first explosion collapsed only part of the well. Ed Franklin asked Engelman if he could try it, saying he had used dynamite before when he was in the service. You know, I'm thinking, why don't you use, uh, like, five really going to cave in? You think? I think so. All right. You're careful, right. man. I can do that. You can do it. All right? All right, I tell you what, why don't you head on back with them, and I'll get this wired up. It's going to be a real 4th of July. I believe you're right. As Rita's story went, everyone took cover while Franklin prepared the charge. About a minute later, the blast went off. Dr. Engelman pronounced Franklin dead at the scene. After Sally Franklin collected on Ed's life insurance, she paid Engelman $16,000. Rita remembered her saying it was an investment in the drag strip. The death was investigated and determined to be an accident. There was about a one-page uh, accidental death report that the uh, Missouri State Patrol completed that day. Uh, the main witness that he relied upon, or they relied upon at that time, was, uh, was uh, Dr. Engelman himself. The drag strip went bankrupt and was never completed. Rita went on to tell investigators um, about still another murder. Yeah. This one involved Barbara Boyle Graham, a woman Engelman had known for more than 20 years. Rita told investigators she first met Barbara at a barbecue. An attractive blonde, Barbara had once lived upstairs from Engelman in his mother's house. It seemed clear to Rita that the divorcee was more than just a friend. Rita told McGarvey that Barbara also lost a husband. Russell Graham was found shot and bludgeoned to death in the back of his car. Peter remembered Engelman confiding to her that he and Barbara were going to kill us. At the time, we were receiving this information from Mrs. Engelman. Uh, it, was, it was an unbelievable story, but she had so much detail on each of the cases that she, she was uh, telling us about that uh, it was enough information that would, if with a little cooperation, we could prove up each case. McGarvey contacted Bob Hertz at the Madison County Sheriff's Office. Detective Hertz was familiar with the Graham murders. Trouble was, Russell Graham's murder had already been solved. Prison inmate Alan Jackson had confessed to it. Well, the problem with that is once we obtain the information from Rita that, uh, that Dr. Engelman had murdered Russell Graham for the reasons as, that we stated. Uh, the confession of Ellen Jackson was a was a was an obstacle that uh, that we had to overcome. McGarvey wondered why Engelman would tell his ex-wife he had killed Russell. He had to consider the possibility that either Rita or Engelman was lying about the murder. This case was becoming more complex by the day. McGarvey now suspected the dentist of killing people in five separate jurisdictions over the past 20 years. If he was going to prove Engelman was a murderer, he would need hard evidence. 